Hello everyone on Facebook. I hope you are well. Today is April 6, 2020. And <clears throat> it is 7.10 p.m. It is week, uh, Holy Week. It is day two of Holy Week. Um, this upcoming Sunday, or Sunday is Easter, and I hope that you are focusing on that. I know that it is troubling times, challenging times. The coronavirus is out, but I do hope that you are focusing on the real meaning of this season, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if you're not familiar, um, you, may, you may be familiar, you may not be familiar, but last night I started a, um, I decided that it would be beneficial, I hope it would be beneficial, that each day I'll kind of give a devotion based on um, the Luke, Luke's account of Holy Week. That every day, uh, day one, day two, day three, there's certain events that happen up to uh, uh, the resurrection of Christ, which is Easter. So I thought it would be nice to every day give a devotion and talk about what happened on this particular day some 2,000 years ago um, on Holy Week and then give a little devotional and a little prayer. Yesterday I talked about the triumphal entry uh, known as Palm Sunday. Now, um, as we go forward, what you'll notice uh, today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, it's difficult and challenging to exactly determine what happened on these specific days. The reason for this is that Luke... Um, Matthew and uh, the other gospel writers, they don't give specific days on what happened. Um, they don't clue us in. They don't say like on Monday this happened, on Tuesday this happened. We know that he entered uh, Jerusalem on a Sunday because it was Palm Sunday, a triumphal entry. Um, there's a clue in that. Um, we know that on Thursday, this upcoming Thursday, is uh, what is typically known as Monday Thursday or the Passover meal. Um, we know that he had Passover on Thursday. We know that he was crucified on Friday. A lot of that is due to the fact that he was um, resurrected on a Sunday and that able uh, understanding how the Jews understood time and everything and understanding that Jesus said that he was going to be in the grave for three days, you know, doing all the math and, and taking into context how they understood how days happen and the evenings happen. We can give a good idea that Thursday there's a Passover, Friday he was crucified, Sunday he was resurrected. But between Palm Sunday and Thursday, which is Passover, we, we don't have any clues on this is what happened. Uh, both Matthew and Luke say that he entered into Jerusalem on a Sunday, Palm Sunday. He goes in to clear the temple, and then he teaches in the temple, and there's other events that happen. But we're not told exactly the specifics of it. So in, uh, in retrospect of it, in, in, in consideration of that, what I'm going to do for Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday is I'm going to pick certain passages from uh, Luke chapter 20, verse 1, to um, the preparation of the Passover, which is uh, chapter 22. So the next two uh, chapters, from chapter 20 to verse, uh, chapter 22, because chapter 22 is when the festival of unleavened bread or uh, the Passover begins. So some, so basically, what I basically between chapters 20. And chapter 22 in Luke, that encompasses all of what happened Monday to Wednesday. Uh, scholars debate exactly uh, what happened on this day and what happened on that day. I'm not really going to get into the ins and outs and the details and uh, the nuances. Um, I'm just going to pick certain passages uh, for the next three days based on those two chapters, uh, give a devotion and pray for that. Um, I'm not going to read all of the two chapters. I, as I said, I'm only going to pick certain passages. How, passages, however, I welcome you, I highly encourage you, um, for the next um, three days, however you want to do it, um, divide chapters 20 to 22 in thirds. And 
uh, maybe tonight after I'm done, uh, read a third of it, you know, maybe read a little bit of chapter 20. Then Tuesday, read a little bit, maybe half of chapter 21. And then on Wednesday, read, you know, the other half of 21. However way you want to do it, I encourage you to read chapter 20 and chapter 21 over the course of the next three days. So today, oh, and I should also mention um, that uh, over the course of uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, um, I am going to attempt to give these devotions at about 7 o'clock, give or take 10 minutes. So about 7 o'clock, um, just kind of maybe in your purview, um, just, you know, kind of keep Facebook open if you're interested in, in this. And around about 7 o'clock is when I'm going to be presenting these devotions. So today I've decided that I'm going to read from Luke chapter 20, verse 9 to verse 19. It's a, it's a short little passage. You may be familiar with it. If not, then that's great because now you're being welcome to this passage. Again, I, will, I encourage you to read the rest of uh, however way you want to do it, read the rest of uh, chapter 20 and 21. But today we're going to look at <clears throat> chapter 20, verses 9 to 19. He, being Jesus, began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and leased it to tenants and went to another country for a long time. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants in order that they might give him his share of of the produce of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty handed. Next, he sent another slave that one also they beat and insulted and sent away empty handed. And he sent still a third. This one also they wounded and threw out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they discussed it among themselves and said, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that, so that the inheritance may be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Heaven forbid! But he looked at them and said, what then does this text mean? The stone that the builders rejected has become the corner, cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the scribes and chief, chief priests realized that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to lay hands on him that the, <clears throat> on that very hour but they feared the people. So a couple, a few things to notice in this passage. He tells a parable, and in the parable, he mentions that a man planted a vineyard. Now, this man in this parable is God. The vineyard is what could be considered at the time Israel, um, oh, although broadly speaking, you could claim that the vineyard is the church universal from or the people of God. That might be a better term. Um, the vineyard represents the people of God. And in various ages and various times, um, the structure of the people of God have, have been different. So in the Old Testament, the people of God were the Israelites, and they had the tabernacle, they had the temple, etc. And, and nowadays, after Jesus came and resurrected the people of God, or everybody, including Jews and Gentiles, all who name Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they, um, for lack of a better term, go to church. Um, so the vineyard represents the people of God. So God planted the people of God, made the people of God, and he leased it to the tenants. Now, the tenants, um, broadly speaking, are what you would consider the priests, the religious elites. I'm not going to say the Pharisees or Sadducees. They didn't come until later on, but it was basically the leaders that were supposed to instruct the people of God, the, at this time, the Israelites. The Gentiles hadn't really been a part of the picture. Um, they had been a little bit, for, but for most, 
mostly speaking, they hadn't been. It's, it, we're really talking about the Israelites here. And so these tenets are the leaders, the religious leaders that are supposed to instruct the people on who God is and what God expects of them as a people and how they ought to behave and how they ought to act as the people of God. And then it talks about how God went to another country. Uh, don't take that literally. It's not like God planted you know, the people of God and then disappeared and didn't do anything. This is a parable. It's to uh, be a metaphor to kind of grasp the attention of people. The idea is that God um, made the religious leaders kind of as a steward to instruct the people. They gave them the responsibility to perform the sacrifices and instruct the people on, on who God is and how they ought to behave, things of that nature. Now, eventually, when the season came, we're not told when the season is. Again, it's a parable, it's a metaphor. But eventually, um, when the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants in order that they might give him his share of the produce of the vineyard. Um, over the next course of these few verses, God is basic, the, the slaves that God is sending is representative of the prophets. God, Jesus is ba in this parable is basically giving a huge, broad outlook of the events of the Old Testament, all the way from the institution of the Israelite people, all the way up to the point where Jesus comes as the Son of God or as the Messiah. And so these slaves that are being sent, he sends three. Um, the, these are what could be representative as all of the prophets that God sends to the people. Um, you can think of people like Isaiah, Ezekiel, other prophets uh, that we know of, the minor prophets, the major prophets, probably prophets we don't even know of. These slaves represent the prophetic voice that God was sending to Israel. And, and if you know your, your Bible, and if you don't, that's fine. Read all the Old Testament uh, kings and chronicles and things of that nature. And what you find is that uh, over time, the Israelites began to engage in idolatry and began to engage in wicked behavior. And God sends prophets to them trying to instruct them to get their act together, to worship God alone and behave in the way that God wants them to behave. What we notice in this passage, however, is that the tenants, remember the tenants are um, the stewards, the religious leaders of the time, again, broadly speaking, representative of them. They're upset at the prophets. What do they do to the prophets? Well, they kill the prophets. They persecute the prophets. They beat up the prophets. Um, and we see this in the Old Testament. You, I think of Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah is a great example of a prophet being persecuted um, continuously for the prophetic voice and the prophecies that he gives. So if you read all throughout the Old Testament, prophets from Isaiah all the way onward, many of them are being persecuted for basically telling the people and telling the religious leaders and the religious elites and um, the stewards that ought to be instructing the people and doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're being the pro These prophets doing that are being persecuted for that message. Now, um, so they, you know, the prophetic voice, the, the prophets are being persecuted. Then he tells the parable, in, halfway into the parable, he says, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son, perhaps they will respect him. Well, the beloved son, obviously, from understanding scripture, you probably understand, this is Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. God sends Jesus. Okay, all the other prophets, uh, they didn't listen to the prophets. Surely they will listen to the Son of God. Surely they will listen to uh, the Messiah. Now, in this time, in this age, this this was a big deal. If you had an owner send one of his children as essentially an ambassador to voice what the father, what the owner uh, wants, um, in that day and age, you gave the same amount of respect to the son as you would the father, because the son, although may not be the father, represents the father fully, completely, has full authority. Um, and, and you really could argue that the slaves being sent, all those slaves, if they come bearing the signet or the symbol or the sign of the father, they carry the weight of authority. So already the tenants, these people that 
own this vineyard, quote unquote, or already would have been viewed as disrespectful, rude, um, betraying, um, very uh, not in a good light because they are persecuting and beating up the the slaves, those who come bearing the authority of the owner. Well, as I said, the slaves represent the prophets and, and the owner is God. Well, now we get into the son. So the prophets or the slaves, they're not going to listen to them. The tenants don't listen to them. So the owner, or God, sends the son. And we're told that the tenants do not want to listen to what the son has to say. In fact, they want to take the inheritance for the <clears throat> for themselves. Another way of understanding it is that they want the vineyard. They want the vineyard. They don't believe, for whatever reason, that the owner should operate or own the vineyard. They want the vineyard. They want control and they want power over the vineyard. And so that's why when the son comes in this parable, they decide to take up arms against him, to kill him. Now in this parable, the son of God represents Jesus. And later on, as we are told, the chief priests and the scribes, they realize that this parable is against them. That makes sense because at this time, Jesus is talking. <laughs> Jesus is present. Jesus exists among them as the Son of God, as the Messiah. So the tenets during his time would have been the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the religious elites, the religious leaders of the time. So that parable, that, that section where it says the tenants wanted to kill the Son of God, he's directly talking about the chief priests, the Pharisees and Sadducees. And we see that all throughout the Gospels that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John paint the religious leaders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the elites of the time, as those who want power, those who want control. They want the power and control to dictate the temple and dictate what happens in Jerusalem. They don't want to give that control or power up to Jesus, up to the Messiah, or even to God. And that's what stirs them on to jealousy. That's what stirs them on toward acting against Jesus and as and if you read chapter the, these next two chapters and as we will look at over the next couple days Jesus isn't afraid to confront that and because of that they then start to plot against Jesus because they realize that the people and the time start to follow Jesus they're losing their grip of power they're losing their grip of control and they get to a point where they say the only way we can really get control and power back is to kill jesus we have to get rid of this man because if we don't get rid of this man we will lose control and power so that upsets them and then uh jesus mentions the stone that the builders rejected the stone being jesus the builders being the religious elites they reject jesus and Jesus now becomes the cornerstone. The cornerstone of what? Well, he's the cornerstone of the people of God, the church. Now we get into the section uh, later on after telling this parable. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. The idea here is that in a roundabout way, Jesus is saying... If you try to attack this stone, you will be crushed. You will be destroyed. Um, it will not go good for you. And so in a roundabout way, Jesus is kind of saying to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious elites, if you try to kill me, if you try to destroy me, if you try to destroy this stone, um, it will backfire and, and you will be crushed. And we understand in hindsight, history-wise, that that's exactly what happens, that they do lose control, they do lose power, um, and uh, the people of God then are changed into a different direction. So that is uh, the overall, this is part of what happens sometime between Monday and Wednesday. Now, how can we appropriate that and apply that into our own lives? Well, 
God has given each one of us stewardship over something. Perhaps you are a parent. God has given you stewardship over your ch children. Perhaps you're a pastor like myself. God has given you some type of stewardship over a congregation. Perhaps you are an employer. God has given you stewardship of those who work under you. Perhaps you're none of those and you're just simply a citizen of a community. You still have a stewardship to your community. You have a stewardship to creation. You have a stewardship to maybe your spouse. You have a responsibility to care for those under you, to care for those uh, that you're part of a family, part of a part of community, part of creation. That may be big, that may be small. Um, people who are who own mega corporations, they are responsible and stewards of huge business and many, many people. Uh, but maybe you only have one child or or maybe you're just part of the community and your stewardship is small. That regardless of how large or small your stewardship, your responsibility, your your call to care for those around you, God has given that to you. And we're not perfect, but God expects each one of us in our own way to do the very best job that we can within the grace of God to be the very best steward that we can be. And not to seek power, not to seek control, but rather to plant and till the quote unquote vineyard. I'm using vineyard in, this, in, in the metaphor in the sense of, of whatever you're in stewardship over. To till that and produce it for God. Producing meaning to give, to, to till it in such a way that brings God glory and till it in such a way that is redemptive, that is beneficial for the actual vineyard. So we, whatever responsibility God has given you, whatever vineyard God has given you, God wants you, wants me, wants us to do it in such a way that he gets the glory for it and that benefits the people around us or the creation around us, whatever that vineyard is. I'm not saying that, that God's wrath or punishment is going to come down upon us because I don't think necessarily we can appropriate and apply that necessarily, but I do believe that we can appropriate and apply the, the general principle, the general idea that God expects us to till the vineyard that God has given us and that we will be held accountable for how well we till that vineyard. So I hope that blesses you this day to some degree. And um, I would say, one, remember that uh, we're not perfect. Don't try to till the vineyard in your own power, because the only way we can truly till that vineyard is through the power, the empowerment and grace of God. Again, I hope that uh, encourages you today. Tomorrow we are going to look at another passage uh, in these two chapters that happen between this time span between Monday and Wednesday. Uh, it'll happen around 7 o'clock-ish. And um, so I hope that God uh, keeps you well, keeps you safe, draws you closer together, uh, that you are growing closer together as a family during this time, and that your faith is growing during this time as well. I'm going to go ahead and say a quick prayer, and then I'm going to end. God, thank you for this time. We lift your name on high. Worthy is your name. Worthy are you. No matter what happens on earth, you are worthy to be praised. And we know that we have our own vineyards you have given us. And it's not our vineyard. It's your vineyard. And you have asked us to be the very best steward that we can. Not out of our own power, but by the grace of God through your empowerment. And we ask us, we ask you, God, to empower us, to bring us grace, to enliven in us, that we might till the vineyard you have given us, whatever that be, in such a way that your name is glorified and in such a way that is redemptive and beneficial for the vineyard. 
We thank you and we love you. Please be with us this day. Keep us safe. Help us to grow closer to you to, in this time and grow closer to one another, um, our neighbors, our family in this time. Again, we love you. We thank you. And your name is worthy to be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless everyone. I hope you are well, and I will catch you tomorrow, Lord willing. God bless.